Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So um, we're going to have this lovely morning on psychedelics. Literally a trip of a lifetime. You will find a package under your chair. <laughs> Joking. That I would try to get the gift bag from Saib and they didn't allow it, but it's okay. So um, who has not taken psychedelics here? Okay. Wonderful. So we will be embracing... Um, the journey onto what is and what are the possibilities of the future of mental health and psychedelics. I'm Gabriella Wright, I'm your moderator. I'm the co-founder of Never Alone, which is a mental health initiative of the Chopra Foundation. I am surrounded by incredible individuals here. Dr. Deepak Chopra, as you know, is who he is. But today, <laughs> he has an amazing quote since yesterday. It's called, love it as it is. So let's love Deepak as he is, and let's start this conversation. We have incredible Christy Strongman, who's a therapist. She has a private practice in New York. She actively works as a therapist with MAPS on the research of psychedelics. And we have Doug Drysdale, who is the CEO of Cybin, a biotech company that is working with psychedelics specifically for the future of mental health. So let's start. Deepak, what, how can we create a bridge between consciousness and psychedelics? And what are the similarities and the differences? Let me share with you a couple of quotes uh, from luminaries who've had a psychedelic experience without taking the psychedelics. Uh, William Blake, we are led to believe a lie when we see with and not through the eye. That was born in a night to perish in a night while the soul slept in beams of light. Here's another quote from Walt Whitman and maybe I'm not going to be quoting him exactly, but I'll try and remember. I must not be awake, for everything looks to me as it never did before, or else I'm awake for the first time, and everything else was a mean sleep. Wittgenstein. We are asleep. Our life is a dream. But once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. And finally, the Buddha, before he passed on to another dimension, he said, this lifetime of ours is transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at the movements of a dance. A lifetime is like a flash of lightning in the sky rushing by like a torrent down a steep mountain. And his favorite disciple, Ananda, then responded. He said, who are you? Are you God? Are you a messiah? Are you, uh, are you a messenger? And he said, none of the above. And so, so then who are you? And the Buddha's last words were, I'm awake. So with those quotes, I want to share with you that what we call everyday reality, this one right now, this room, your own body, my body, everything that's happening outside, and everything that can be given a name, anything that can be given a name, is actually a product of the conditioned mind. So up until... 40,000 years ago, there were about eight types of humanoids. Humanoids means exactly the same physiognomy, uh, different species, but the same family, like cats and lions are the same family. And one particular species, humans, created a new language, and that was not about danger or mating or food, but about creating stories, models, and constructs. And we live by those constructs, latitude, longitude, money, Wall Street, nation states, tribes. And this 
conditioned mind has created this separation between us. In reality, fundamental reality, there's no separation. Everything is entangled. Everything, you know, roomy. We come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. That's a psychedelic experience. When Moses fed manna to the Israelites, I bet you there was fungus in it. <laughs> when Jesus converted the water into wine, I can bet you there was fungus in it. <laughs> in the Rig Veda 9th and 10th mandalas, there are hymns devoted to a psychedelic called Soma. So these practices have existed since ancient, ancient times. What they do is they take you beyond the dark alleys and the ghost-filled attics and the secret passages of your mind which bamboozles you into thinking this is reality. This is not reality. This is a projection of reality. Reality is infinite possibilities, infinite creativity, infinite correlation, synchronicity, unpredictability, self-regulation, self-evolution, mm -hmm. and amazing imagination. So by loosening the neural correlates of the collective mind, which uh, exist in our brain, and loosening the neural correlates of the ego mind, which is called the default mode network, or what you know, Aldous Huxley called the reducing valve, you enter a totally different domain of awareness. You lose your fear of death, you understand your universal nature, and you have the spontaneous emergence of what we call platonic values, truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. And if you're lucky, lose the fear of death because you realize that your fundamental reality is not in space-time. It is without cause, it is spaceless, dimensionless, and infinite dimensions at the same time. It is timeless, it is irreducible, it is fundamental, it is formless, and it is infinite, and it is you. The self of the individual is the self of the universe. There's no better gift we can get to discover who we are. Because once you find out who we are, as Rumi said, by God, when you find yourself, you'll be the idol of yourself. That's how they work. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Um, so, thank you, Deepak, for having this introduction to set the stage because we are all here for a mini documentary series called Open Minds. And it's going to be airing and premiering on April 19th on Alter TV. So, I think I just want to set the stage with the trailer, if we could show that. And then we'll take the. I think psychedelics might wake us up. And if they do, then maybe we can re-engineer the world. It's this ability to step outside yourself, literally. You know, there's no separation between you and the cosmos. And psilocybin reliably can induce a mystical experience. They have this special power, not only of fixing what's broken, but improving what works and expanding our capabilities. They're finding that roughly two-thirds of people with treatment-resistant PTSD no longer qualify for a PTSD diagnosis. It seems like the results are, are life-changing. The cost of, you know, to use the broad term, mental illness continues to mount, and there's this lack of effective treatments. Unlike other medicines, where we take them every day, here's a potential way to remove someone's, say, addictive cravings, just like that, for weeks or months at a time for maybe just one or two doses. I try not to use the word miraculous, but I feel that it is miraculous. <laughs> I see the immense value of focusing on psychedelics today for the reversal of, of real trauma. It will be like taking the handcuffs off. I don't think it can remain an underground phenomenon anymore. We've already reached critical mass with this movement. I envision a world where people can have open minds.
So here we are. A thank you to the incredible filmmakers and, and producers who made this happen because, as you know, there has been a war on psychedelics since 1970s and, there, and it shut down the research. There were incredible luminaries before who we all know and Deepak named a few earlier. But today we're looking at the resurgence of how this can truly help us, how this can be, quote unquote, a miraculous experience for the mental health crisis of today. Every 40 seconds, someone dies by suicide. My own sister died by suicide four years ago. And thanks to that awareness, that blind spot, I'm here today um, on a crusade, one could call it, but here to support these incredible voices to find solutions because we all suffer. We all suffer in our corners. We all experience loneliness at some point, and we need to find a togetherness. And if this can help us, then let's go on that journey. Yes. Christy, um, you have a hands-on relationship with your patients and, and your clinical practice. Um, just to feed into what Deepak said earlier, from what I've heard, you had a very spiritual quote unquote experience with psychedelics even before you knew you were becoming um, a therapist, quote unquote. So I'd love you to share that story to inspire the audience. Sure. When I was a young child, um, I would find myself singing a lot of the time just to myself and reading a lot of devotional books and um, uh, reading the Bible, reading, you know, um, I ideas that other people have given me about, like, their own prayers. Um, I guess I was kind of an odd kid instead of going out because I wasn't really allowed to go out during the weekends. I would stay in my room and just read and, and sing to myself. And I found that this sort of created a connection with, I called it the divine. And later I would consider that as part of myself. And it wasn't until several years after I was um, a little grown up um, in my 20s when I would hear the word psychedelics and when people would talk about what they experienced during psychedelics, it made me go back into my own experiences when I was a preteen and teenager. And I thought, well, this is, this is what I experienced. And um, in my 20s, I felt that I lost a little bit of that connection just in, with life and all of that. So that's when I decided to, to look into psychedelics. And sure enough, I, was able, I felt I was able to reestablish that connection with myself, with that spiritual godhead. Um, and of course, as time went on, then I started reading about psychedelics being used in mental health and I could really understand why that was even a thing because during my own experiences, I was working on myself. I was connecting again with, with the greater me, the greater everyone, everything that I couldn't help but to feel connected to. And so I decided to become a therapist and I found myself working for MAPS as a therapist in their phase three clinical studies. Do you want to explain what phase three yes. clinical studies mean so you, you understand where we're yes. at? Yes, so, so the FDA allows us to, to do uh, studies with people that have medication resistant PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And so there are, there's a certain, um, there are certain levels that you have to go through in order for a prescription to then become acceptable. Um, that you can get through your doctor or a treatment. And so we're going through that process. In fact, MAPS, uh, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, has been doing this since the 80s. Um, so I primarily work with MDMA, with these patients that have post-traumatic stress disorder, that nothing has helped them. They have lived with this for decades and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, really limits one's life, one's experience of the self and, and their loved ones. And I can tell you that having firsthand experience working with these patients, that from the first dosing, which is actually, I'm sorry, three dosings uh, to qualify for the study, just after the very first one of the three, there's a dramatic change in the way that they're able to look at their traumas 
to be able to really even communicate about the things that they weren't able to look at. Mm -hmm. um, and it really is a, a magnificent way to do self-work and especially with uh, having a therapist there because there's two of us and as they're processing, uh, it's, it's, it's really eye-opening uh, even for us therapists to be able to then say, Maybe if we were able to do this much more with a greater population, not just with a smaller uh, group of people that were able to qualify for these um, uh, Study. studies, mm -hmm. it would really be a monumental way for us to really awaken to ourselves. Yeah. That's my hope. That's a wonderful hope. <coughs> it's beautiful, beautiful. I mean, psychedelics are already helping people, whether it's an underground movement or whether it's, you know, here in, in this context where we can openly talk about it. And Cybin, this is a public company, and, and you are literally on the forefront of psychedelic research and, and extracting from what I've understood um, a certain uh, strand and molecules of psilocybin and and for them to be implemented in a faster experience. So can you just obviously expand on that because I'm obviously not a doctor, um, <laughs> or am I a biotech um, investor? But it would it'd be great so that everyone can understand what are the possibilities are in your landscaping. Yeah, maybe I'll just start, first of all, by thanking uh, Altered TV uh, for making this yeah. docu-series and for all of the, the cast members yeah, too. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> it, it's, it's such important work. Um, we've spent decades uh, receiving misinformation about psychedelics Absolutely. and uh, this building stigma uh, around psychedelics because of the war on drugs. And now we're in a situation where we have quite a high hill to climb to change people's minds about psychedelics. Um, so this is really important work. Uh, and what we're doing at Cybin is all about changing minds. So changing the minds of the general public, changing the minds of regulators, uh, changing our patients' minds from being uh, depressed to not being depressed. So we have two clinical trial programs underway right now, and they are modified versions of psilocybin and DMT, which is another tryptamine. And uh, our depression study that's ongoing right now is, is dosing patients with this modified version of, of psilocybin. We've modified it so that it can deliver more reliable results, uh, and also so that it's a little shorter, just a, a few hours rather than a whole day uh, of treatment. So fits into the healthcare system a little more conveniently. But what's really powerful uh, is what we're seeing as patients come out of those experiences, as, as Christy was, was mentioning, to see patients that have suffered from depression for 20 or 30 years, carrying this huge burden um, low energy, low motivation, really struggling to talk about their problems at all, and to come out after a single dose, one dose, a single session, for many of them, um, it's like somebody switched on a light. Uh, the weight is lifted, uh, they are talkative, uh, they're engaging, uh, you're not having to pull information out of them, they're hugging the, the therapists, uh, thanking God repeatedly. Uh, thanking God. Thanking God. Thank uh, and, and many of them are uh, describing the experience as one of the most profound experiences of their lives, up there with having their first child. I mean, truly profound experiences. So we've been treating depression for 30 or 40 years with drugs that we give people every day. Uh, they have a number of side effects, and they work for about a third of people um, with depression. Uh, but they take months and months and months to work. And um, you heard one comment on, on the trailer about handcuffs. Some people feel like these are chemical handcuffs because they're blunting. Absolutely. So we can move away from that sort of day-to-day -day management of symptoms to really tackling the under underlying causes of depression well, with these treatments and change people's lives in that way. It's, it's truly stunning and truly powerful for the patients that it works in. Nothing works for everybody, of course. Uh, but this work, uh, uh, these communications to change perceptions are really important so that we can bring these treatments to patients. Mm, that's wonderful. Almost, I find it interesting that everyone is having a spiritual experience, mm -hmm. it seems, you know. 
So they're going through the dark night of the soul and the first thing they do is they're thanking God. And I find that fascinating because the work of Deepak Chopra, he's been a consciousness explorer, but he's also an MD, he's a medical doctor. Um, and, and the work that we do at the foundation is researching consciousness and how do we explore consciousness in a way that we can all be free from suffering. Um, Deepak, um, since you're the only doctor on this panel, I'd love, to, I'd love the audience to understand the difference, maybe what a psilocybin or an MDMA does on the brain, even from a scientific perspective, just so that we understand what communication pathways are, are enhanced or not. So the human brain uh, evolved as did all other species in the savanna. And we have three brains, actually. We have a reptilian, oh, let me use a handy model for you. Okay, this is a handy model, and the pun is intended. Okay. <laughs> this is your cerebral cortex, where you use your intellect. Right now, you're using your intellect, and this part of your brain is being activated because this is a conversation that excites this part of the brain. If, and this brain has evolved only 4,000, uh, let's say uh, 5 million years in evolution. This brain rapidly evolved when we learned to use language. And then we created all these models that I mentioned. If I open my hand here, you'll see my thumb. That's the emotional brain. And this brain actually is much older than this brain. It's five million years. This brain, emotional brain, is 100 million years old. Okay, so we pretend to be creatures of rationality, but we're actually bristling with emotion. And even when we make rational decisions, they're based on our emotions. Okay, now if I, so that's my emotional brain, and where you see my thumb, that's my reptilian brain, which is responsible for fight, flight, and actually right now, in our civilization, the reptilian brain and the dysfunctional emotional brain, the separate brain, has created what we call social injustice, racism, bigotry, hatred, hmm. eco-destruction, extinction of species, poison in our food chain, war, terrorism, mechanized death, and much more. Because these three brains are not integrated. Now, with psychedelics or with other experiences, meditation, mindfulness, metacognition, mantra meditation, combined with music and other kinds of protocols which we have created at the Chopra Foundation, what really happens in the brain is at many levels. So one is there is agonism of serotonin. So the normal antidepressants are called SSRIs, serotonin inhibitors, uptake inhibitors, this actually it creates an action at the receptor where the effect is enhanced of serotonin, probably other things, dopamine, oxytocin, <coughs> opiates, etc. And there's a new peptide that has been identified, it's called anandamide, the, the peptide of bliss. So at a cellular level, that's what's happening. At a neuro, neural correlate level, what's happening is there's neurogenesis sometimes, and there's synaptogenesis, which means neurons increase in size, and they start to connect with each other. So you have to realize that your brain is created by evolution and your genes, but it is then sculpted by your experiences, every experience, emotional experience, intellectual experience, whatever. But that field is called neuroplasticity. By making conscious choices and by attending to sensory experience with awareness without inter interpretation, you actually increase neurogenesis and synaptogenesis. The other thing that happens is, I mentioned earlier, the default mode network cools down. And the default mode network is houses our ego. So there's ego dissolution to some extent. And all our collective problems and our personal problems, of course, come from ego. The need to defend, the need to be right, the need to be validated, sometimes superior, sometimes inferior, 
these are social constructs. Um, we are equal beings, but the social contract create these, these boundaries. So these boundaries get dissolved. That's the neural correlates. Then there's something else that happens. Inflammation goes down and self-regulation kicks in and homeostasis occurs. Homeostasis means back to balance, a state of uh, dynamic non-change in the midst of change. That's fundamental self-regulation and healing. So many things are happening all at the same time. But one other thing that happens and is that, you know, our brain normally processes time in a linear manner, past, present, and future. That's also a social construct based on the ego identity and the subject-object split. I'm Deepak, you are John, and we are separate. But when that sep separate uh, subject-object split dissolves, then, of course, you have the experience that people call the religious or spiritual experience. What I was going to say that, you know, therefore, what one other thing can happen. You can experience nonlinear, transpersonal, nonlinear, transpersonal reordering of space time. And the experience is basically a holographic representation of the universe, a fractal of the universe, a holo movement. And you realize that you are that. As Rumi said, you're not just a drop in the ocean, you're also, you're, you're not just a drop in the ocean, you're also the ocean in the drop. So the drop recognizes that it is the ocean. These are some of the mechanisms. Can I, can I add? Yes. Would you mind? So <clears throat> I'd love to steal an analogy from Michael Pollan, if that's all right. And Please. many of you may have seen uh, the Netflix series, How to Change Your Mind. He uses a great analogy, I think, to uh, translate the science, uh, which is that um, it's about forming habits. We all form habits. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good thing, so we don't have to learn and relearn all the, the time. conditioning. It's we conditioning. You learn how to walk up the stairs, you only have to learn it Absolutely. once. Um, and that's when we're thinking positively, that's good. In some conditions like depression and anxiety, people have these maladaptive patterns of thinking, which means they're, they're negative thoughts or they're ruminating. And these are bad habits, if you like. Mm -hmm. And he likens it to skiing down a hill. And you ski down the hill and you, you do it every day and you're forming ruts in the snow. And these are their old habits. But after a while, you can't get out of the ruts. Absolutely. You keep staying in those negative maladaptive patterns of thinking. And so what psychedelics are able to do are to act like a fresh fall of snow. Hmm. So you can ski in a different direction. That is a beautiful image. Yeah. Wow. That's lovely. I love that. I wish it was mine. It was <laughs> <it>. <laughs> um, actually, Deepak, I was going to... Can you take us to the universe right now? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think since he's here. First, let me ask you a question. Are you finding this conversation interesting? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now please listen to me very carefully and don't screw this up. Okay. <laughs> please listen very carefully. I'm going to ask you the same question. And the question is what? Are you finding this conversation interesting? And that's the question, and then the answer is an enthusiastic yes, but this time, this time, don't answer me till I raise my hand, okay? All agreed? The instruction is clear? Are you finding this conversation interesting? So, the question is a thought. The answer is a thought. But you're not a thought. You're a soul or a spirit or an awareness in which thoughts come and go. So now I'm going to ask you the same question and then we'll do the meditation. But this time, don't answer. 
This time just stay in the stillness. Stay in the stillness because you're right now in the stillness. That awareness is your soul. Are you finding this conversation interesting? Be aware of yourself. That presence you feel is your soul. That presence you feel right now is your soul. It was there when you were a baby. Different body, different mind. There when you were a teenager, it's there now. All the way to dusty death, and even after <laughs> the dusty death, till the next recycling. So now let's do the meditation. Stay in that space, stillness. Just move your eyes a little bit in different directions. And mentally say to yourself, I'm the presence in everything that is seen. I am the presence in everything that is seen. Now close your eyes. And listen to any sound. In this case, the sound is my voice. But whatever the sound is, well, there's a faint humming of the air conditioner too. There's an occasional cough. So be aware of sound. And remind yourself, I'm the presence in which every sound is heard. Now bring your awareness to your body and the sensations in your body. Even the sensation of your skin touching your clothes. I am the presence in which every sensation is experienced. Generate saliva in your mouth. Taste it. Taste the back of your teeth, the roof of your mouth. I am the presence in which every flavor is experienced. Bring your awareness to your nostrils. I am the presence in which every fragrance, every odor, every smell is experienced. Bring your awareness to your heart. Think of someone you love. Feel the love in your body. I'm the presence that generates every emotion. It is my choice. Generate some images in your consciousness. Imagine a rainbow. Imagine a beautiful sunset on the ocean. Imagine a waterfall. Imagine red roses. I am the presence in which every vision is imagined. Now ask yourself, I wonder what my next thought is going to be. And observe it as it arises from the invisible unmanifest, appears on the screen of your consciousness and then disappears from wherever it came from. I wonder what my next thought will be. I'm the presence in which thoughts arise and subside like clouds in the sky. I'm not the thoughts, I'm the sky itself.
Now let your presence, your awareness, move outside the boundaries of your skin. Let it be aware of every person in this room. Feel the energy in this room. Now move your awareness outside this room into the convention center, into the city of Austin, Texas, the planet, the solar system, the Milky Way galaxy, and beyond. I'm the presence in which every experience is available in the fabric of space and time. I am. I am present in the fabric of space and time. I am. And now let all of that go and rest in your presence. Rest in your being. Spaceless, timeless, eternal, beyond birth and death, I am. Rest in that presence. Be aware of being aware. Now you can relax into your body and then please open your eyes. Thank you, Deepak. So now that you are at the source of who you are, you are free. You're free from any story in this moment. You're free from any conditioning. You're free from any ruts in the snow. May I say one more sentence? I, of course, I cannot not let him speak. So, you know, <laughs> he said habits. Gabriella said conditioning. And the spiritual traditions call that karma. Okay, mm. So if you close your eyes, do nothing, you'll be aware of a conversation you're having with yourself. Happy thoughts, unhappy thoughts, whatever. That is projecting as this body, and it's called the karmic body. The conditioned mind, the karmic mind, the conceptual mind, whatever. But beyond this is the bliss body. And that's who we are. But sorry for the interruption. Absolutely not. <laughs> Thank you, Deepak. So going back to why we're here, we're here to open our minds, we're here to decondition these stories, we're here to break free, be free from our own suffering, we're here to destigmatize mental health modalities, because first of all, mental health is stigmatized. It just is, depending on our background, our cultural background, where we're from, what conversations we're having at home, then are enough therapists available. That's a reality too. We might want to be helped, but how can we find the tools? How can we have this self-awareness? How can we have these things? So Christy, I, I'd love to, first of all, I don't know many therapists who practice with psychedelics or quote unquote plant medicine. Um, how many are there in the field and, and how can, if some of us want to get into these modalities as therapists, and what are the possibilities right now today? I don't really know how many therapists are out there um, doing this, to tell you the truth. Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. Um, uh, however, MAPS and several other institutions, such as um, California Institute for Integral Studies, CIIS for short, or uh, Naropa University up in Boulder, Colorado, these are all accredited universities that have programs, certificate programs, post-graduate uh, that um, can, can actually train therapists into psychedelic-assisted therapists. Um, however, currently, because 
many of these medicines are still a Schedule One. They're sort of a bottleneck. I just want to tell everyone before they all go to the websites of these universities. There is a bottleneck at the moment just because in order to finalize those certificates, um, you would then have to be part of a clinical study, like I was mentioning before, and then your certificate will be finished, but there are only uh, certain amounts of, of those studies around the world, in the US, Israel, England, uh, Canada, et cetera. Um, but we're hoping that that's going to change according to the founder and executive director of MAPS, that in 2024, uh, MDMA, um, we're hoping that it'll become a prescription medicine for trained therapists to aid their patients with PTSD and other um, other limitations to, to be able to take this medicine as a prescription. And we're also working to try to get insurance companies to wow. be able to pay for That's some great. of that. So all of this is in the works. Send good energy so that we can all have access to these medicines. Oh, it's very yeah. important. Huh? It's, it's, it's so important that we... You know, there's so many different systems. There's, there's the government system. What are the policies that are going to be put in place of how we can use these medicines? Um, there's, there's the protocols as well. We can't just go off on one and, you know, be alone in a corner and quote unquote get high. You know, I, I think there's a different way of approaching how we're, and, and there's, there's also a caring, and there's how do we adapt to these medicines and protocols that we bring into to, to, to our experience of them. And that's why at the foundation, we are actively working to raise public awareness on these, on these protocols. And Deepak, as you just heard, is co-creating them with, um, we have an incredible psychiatrist who works specifically with ketamine-assisted therapy, Dr. Gita Vaid, who's also in New York. Yes. Um, and so we, we are aggregating a critical mass, but as you just heard, there isn't enough of these incredible souls who are leading this crusade. But we hope to get there. In the meanwhile, what does a world look like? And I'm asking you this question, but what would a world look like? And I'm very intrigued in this question because I believe in a world where there should be no trauma. And what happens after trauma? Imagine if we didn't have any trauma, what would we be doing? <laughs> I mean, no, but literally, like, what would we be doing? Meaning, because we always have these things to overcome, but imagine we didn't have anything to overcome and we could just be. We could just be the source of I am that you were sharing earlier. What would you, mm. what would you say? The, the mic got lost. Mm. The mic is having a psychedelic experience. <laughs> Once. Deepak, answer that question. What would the world be like? So, you know, everybody has trauma. Everybody has trauma. So that's what recycles as a person is trauma. Okay, karma recycles, and karma, part of karma is trauma. If you say, I've never had any trauma, maybe you haven't but maybe your parents had it, and uh, you experienced it while you were in the womb. Or maybe your grandparents have it. Now we know from epigenetics that trauma, actually the memory of trauma, is recycled through genes and epigenetic memory. How that happens, memory is a deep mystery, but that trauma recycles. The memory of trauma is anger. Mm. The desire to get even is hostility. The anticipation of trauma, again, because you're scared, is anxiety and fear. Blaming yourself is guilt and humiliation. And the sum total of this is depression. The depletion of this is depression. So at some point, everybody has this. And you say, no, no, I, I, you know, I meditate, I exercise, I have the best relationship, I have most money, I have 10 exits, whatever. Um, <laughs> I don't, I feel life is great. But wait a little bit. Everybody gets old. Everybody at some point, although we feel, hopefully, no infirmity, but everybody also encounters death. 
Okay, so the spiritual tell, traditions tell us that these traumas or these interpretations of injury is what keeps us in fear. And the solution to this is only one thing, is to wake up. That's why I say the waking up from trauma is the waking up to reality, who you are. And who you are is the entire universe. You know, 50% of your atoms in your body come from the Milky Way galaxy. 50% remaining come from other galaxies. There are two trillion galaxies. So who are you? You're the whole universe right now in this moment. Rumi, we are the universe in ecstatic motion. Look at these worlds spinning out of nothingness. This is you. Beyond all ideas of right and wrong, there is a field. I'll meet you there. So yes, if we had no trauma, we would be in the field and we would meet there and we would have immense empathy, immense compassion, immense love and we would know that the only purpose of existence is joy. If there is no joy, then uh, what's the point? I love that. <clears throat> what's the point of life if there's no joy? Oh. So we would all be universes. We would be the source of I am. Um, we're getting to our questions, but I just wanted to... Um, Christy, what would that world look like for you if everyone could you know, have these, whether it's microdosing or psychedelic therapies to accelerate our source to who we are, what do you, what would that look like for you? I think of openness, mm. openness to ourselves, that we could really encounter whatever, whatever we can dream of. Mm. Beautiful. Openness. Openness. Open minds. Yet again, we'll be free. Doug? I'm going to be a little bit more practical. Oh, it's good. I mean, we do need people on the earth. Just, just to bring it back to... In the to, universe, the back, earth, back here to, we are. Back to sort of our everyday <laughs> lives. Um, 900 million people around the world suffering from depression, addiction, an e eating disorder. 300 million people suffering from depression. So this is an enormous problem. Absolutely. It, it's a it's pandemic. Us, it will take us a long time yes. to, to solve it. Depressed patients often have many other comorbidities or other things that are wrong with them. Um, more likely to have high blood pressure, more likely to have heart disease, more likely to find themselves in the hospital, uh, more likely to feel suicidal. Uh, and all of these uh, situations that are add on to their depression put them in the medical system more frequently. So you can imagine if we could take away someone's depression for months at a time, from one or two treatments, we can keep them out of the hospital from all of those other things. So we could actually basically service think, other areas. Think what we could areas. do with the, with the medical system. Absolutely. We could free it up. There aren't enough doctors today. There aren't enough therapists today. Uh, and it's tough to figure out how we're going to find the 40,000 doctors that we're missing at the moment. Perhaps we remove the work mm. by, uh, by curing patients. Thank you. That's very relevant. Thank you so much. Wow, well, I believe that we're gonna go into our Q&As. Um, the first question that we have from our audience is, ha ha, ha 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 ha, I love this one. <laughs> Deepak, would you speak on your first introduction to psychedelic medicine? So in India, um, you go to medical school after two years of pre-med, I entered medical school in 1964 at the age of 18. And shortly after I entered medical school, I was told there was a controlled study on LSD with Harvard Medical School, students from Harvard and some of us included because our, we had an affiliation with Harvard. And we took LSD under controlled conditions I had ego dissolution, but I was also watching a poster of Mother Teresa licking the wounds of children with leprosy. And I was 
filled, overwhelmed with compassion and the desire to heal. And as a medical student, I realized that was my mission, healing. And that healing extended not only to the body, mind, and spirit, but the world. And I didn't take LST since then. I had one shamanic experience in, in Ecuador, and I write, and yeah, shamanic experiences actually more than once, uh, but many years ago. Right now, I'm, I'm not taking psychedelics. I can get into that space anytime, anytime. Just he is the psychedelic. With an intention. <laughs> and and uh, I am promoting the research. So personally, at this moment, I don't feel the need. And that's where you want to get, where you can get into the state of bliss and joy just by intention. Thank you, Deepak. Um, so the next question we have for Doug, um, tell us about the different kinds of psychedelics being explored by Saibin and the pros and cons of each. Sure, sure, okay. So uh, we have two programs, uh, one based around psilocybin and one based around DMT. Uh, psilocybin occurs naturally in about 200 species of mushrooms, magic mushrooms. Yes. If you take uh, psilocybin naturally, it'll last six or eight hours or so, quite a long duration. Uh, we think that's difficult to fit into the healthcare system. Like you yeah, were saying. Right? Yeah. Uh, so if we can reduce that time, that's, that's always good. Because patients take these treatments in a clinical setting under observation, so it's not at home. Absolutely. It's, you know, they're surrounded by a team. Um, and it's also fairly variable because psilocybin is not active. It's a prodrug of psilocin. Uh, so you take the psilocybin, it converts to psilocin in your body, and that enters the brain. Uh, what we've done at Cybin is, is create an analog of psilocybin that, that acts in the same way, and that is it's delivering psilocin. It doesn't require that metabolic step, so it kicks in faster, about 15 minutes or so. Uh, has a duration that's shorter, still a few hours, two, three hours or so. Uh, and, but we've removed some of the variability from that need for metabolism. We all metabolize differently. You might have a pr moderate response. I might have a very profound response from the same dose of natural psilocybin. So we've synthesized this analog uh, to make it more reliable, more predictable, and shorter so that it can fit into the, the healthcare system more appropriately. The goal, of course, ultimately is to gain reimbursement. You know, uh, reimbursement equals access. Currently, I mean, if you, if you have enough money, you could fly to Jamaica or Costa Rica or somewhere and uh, enjoy a, a psilocybin retreat, but that's 1% of the folks that Absolutely. can afford to do that, so we're trying to support patient access. Um, DMT is a little different. It's structurally very similar to psilocybin, uh, but has a very different experience. Psilocybin is very inward in terms of the experience, and, and DMT is, is quite different. Um, often, way, often people will see foreign bodies uh, bouncing basketballs, or think, think it's a, li a little, bit, little bit of a different experience. Obviously, I've never done it. So <laughs> DMT is really short acting. It's broken down very rapidly in the body. Mm -hmm. So if you take a dose. Uh, maybe you'll have a five or ten minute experience. So therapeutically, is that long enough to really do the to work? To integrate. Right, to do the psychological work. So we've uh, created a version that is extended. So maybe 45 to 60 minutes uh, of that. And we're working on those dosings right now. Uh, and that's for anxiety disorders. So our hope is that patients and physicians can choose. Do you, do you want a, a two to three hour internal experience, uh, if the 45 to 60 minute different experience, uh, both likely to work pretty effectively because they have similar mechanisms of action. That's interesting. And I want to actually extend this question to Christy because you're working with MDMA. Correct. So yeah. what, what does that look like? So we've just heard the landscape of psilocybin and DMT. What does that look like when you have the protocol with your patient? Uh, well, it's a, it's a little longer than that. It's um, usually we give about eight hours. Eight hours. Eight hours, but really, I mean, you could say that the the peak and, and the part of the journey before the drop could be about five hours, depending on the dosing and depending on on uh, whether or not they, they also get the, um, the booster afterwards. So first is the initial um, medicine, and then after the booster, um, could be about eight hours. So speaking about 
timing to be able to process and acclimate to that internal space, I do also think that um, elongating that journey can also be very helpful. Interesting. Can I just add though, that the results that you're seeing are spectacular. Absolutely, right. it's really hard not to be so um, celebratory about it, even though we're not yet out of, out of the, the, the woods uh, in legalization, but it really is an outstanding uh, way to process. I've noticed through my own experience as well as through seeing um, my patients. May I add that also as part of the training with MAPS, there is uh, uh, an option for therapists to also take the MDMA. With the... With, with, with two trained therapists that are lead therapists, uh -huh. and that way, as part of one's training, you will know what you're putting your patients through. Oh, yes. I mean, I think that's yes. essential. And it is yeah. magnificent in terms of actually understanding empathically what the patients are going through. Absolutely. Yes. It's a communion, actually, huh? It's a Indeed. communion. Yes. Um, so this is a very important question because what can the public do to help support legalization of psychedelic treatment? Now, this is a very good question because we want the legalization to be accelerated to help people. That's the goal, always in the clinical setting. So what can we do? Christy, again, what, what, what can we do? First, I would say educate yourself about these substances. Watch the docuseries. Watch the documentary series, Open Minds, please. Mm -hmm. Share it, of course, Absolutely. share it. And I really think that the more normalized that uh, consciousness expansion can be, the better. Because mm. that means that we're embracing ourselves more. Psychedelics can then be a tool into ourselves, into healing. Mm -hmm. Doug, anything you, you from yeah, a, a legal perspective? Yeah, we've made tremendous progress. It's incredible how many states and cities have recently, over the last year or two, decriminalized many of these substances. At least for Oregon. just Oregon, yes. Washington DC, Colorado, many others are in the works as well. And then that doesn't mean that these substances are, are becoming legal, but at least uh, they've removed the criminal nature for possession of a small amount of these substances. So that's a start. That's I a think. start, yeah. And I think it's a good indicator of public sentiment. Uh, so many of these bills are in the works in, um, in uh, houses and, and senates across many states right now. So I would say you can vote, vote. for those. So for you those can advocate can vote, for advocate. those, speak up, and, mm. uh, and, and uh, educate yourselves, follow along. Yeah. Educate, yeah, absolutely. Deepak, any um, last words on public awareness? Yeah, at the foundation, our goal is just to bring public awareness to the science behind it, and also public awareness to the great wisdom traditions that actually showed us that uh, we are not uh, human beings having a spiritual experience, but spiritual beings having a human experience. Uh, that's a quote from Thierry de Chardin. We are non-local beings having a local experience, and that experience ultimately gets rid of the fear of death. And uh, it's the key to reality, literally the key to reality, because everything that you otherwise experience is a wonderful magical lie. Wonderful. Your perception tells you the earth is flat. Nobody believes that anymore. Your perception tells you that the ground you're standing on or sitting on is stationary. It's spinning at dizzying speeds and hurtling through space at thousands of miles an hour. Your perception tells you that you're matter, matter. No, you're infinite space. And the congealing, the, the, the resistance of that becomes matter. The fluctuation of that becomes mind. But in reality, you're spirit. So that's the awareness we want to bring to the world. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for listening, everyone. You're amazing. Please go forth. Remember that you're the universe. And uh, let's just go. Let's raise awareness and open our minds. Thank you very much. <laughs>